All right, so let's continue with an overview over the agile methods that are often used in practice. There's, for example, extreme programming and Scrum. Um, there's feature-driven development and Kanban, sometimes also called open Kanban. Um, and two of the most common ones are extreme programming and Scrum. And so I'd like to go into a bit more detail about these two. So extreme programming is generally focused on the, on the development aspects, not as much on the uh, management aspects. And if you key components I've listed here. I'll go into a bit more detail in a moment. So we have user stories as a uh, requirements definition, no, not any longer these um, user and system requirements document, but now user stories. Then we uh, have a very interesting technique called pair programming, and we try to do test first development here. Um, we usually uh, have multiple new versions of our software in every day. Um, then one very fundamental rule is that all tests must pass before we actually integrate new code. Uh, we have a development cycle of roughly two weeks, so a new release should be every uh, there every two weeks. And uh, ideally, we should never delay these releases. And uh, if we can't make the deadline otherwise, we would just have to remove features. So. Um, I already mentioned that we have user stories and um, based on these user stories, we do what's called incremental planning. So we don't um, uh, fi uh, make fixed plan up front. That's obvious, it's an agile uh, method. And for each release, so every two weeks um, from the uh, existing user stories, we select those which we want to support in the upcoming release within the next two weeks based on how much time each one would probably take to implement and what our priorities are. Um, the software design should uh, be kept as simple as possible. So we don't try to um, anticipate future requirements and already design the software more modular than we need it. Um, we will basically just focus on the requirements we have at hand. And if necessary, we'll have to do a bit of refactoring later on. Um, and what's quite difficult, I already mentioned this, is that uh, the fundamental idea in extreme programming regarding customer involvement is that uh, we have always have a representative of the customer as a team member full time. This is of course quite difficult sometimes. If the customer is also just a small company, then they won't be able to dedicate uh, an employee to, to work on the team full time, probably they they want to outsource things, so the the customer can maybe only be involved for each release. But ideally, in a larger project, we always have a customer representative on the team. So um, maybe a bit more detail about what I just mentioned regarding planning for change. So um, the general uh, idea in software engineering was uh, that we should design for change. So we should keep our software design as flexible and as generic as possible. Because if we anticipate that changes will happen and try to, to build that in now, then later we uh, can save time to, to adapt our software to those new requirements because it's already very flexible and generic. Um, however, extreme programming now takes a different perspective. The idea here is that we won't be able to actually anticipate uh, future changes in any way that's actually reliable. So when we uh, try to build our code really generic upfront, and then later on, we'll have to, to rewrite or redo it anyway, because we ended up with the wrong generalization, then we will have wasted all that effort basically for nothing. So the idea here is that we don't try to anticipate what's uh, coming up in the future, but we'll rather um, just design for the requirements in the current iteration. And if necessary, we re refactor our code and, and generalize it later on, if when it's actually necessary. 
All right. I already mentioned that uh, a core component regarding the requirements description are user stories. So I'd like you to show you an example of how such a user story might actually look like. So it's really written in the in the form of a little story with a with, with a protagonist basically. Here it's Kate who's a doctor and wants to prescribe medication and so on. And it kind of describes how that fictional user would go through a um, a specific task with uh, the software product. Uh, for example, in this case, it's actually how Kate is prescribing some kind of medication. And the idea behind these user stories is that it, uh, if you have these, these fictional people acting out uh, and actually using the software, then uh, when you write these user stories, you're um, kind of getting into the mindset of a user and you try to imagine how a user would actually interact with the system. And then you'll have less of a developer perspective that's maybe too focused on the system internals. And uh, so the user stories are designed to make you as a developer think more like the, the user who's then actually going to, to use the product later on. Um, and user, usually there's two levels of, um, of detail. One is the user story itself. And then later on, these user stories are broken down into tasks. So for example, uh, for this uh, user story, we might have three tasks. One is to uh, change uh, the dose of a drug. Uh, the second would be to select the actual formulary that's uh, supposed to be uh, prescribed. And the third task is um, dose checking, which is something the system should do, of course, to make sure that um, the doctor doesn't uh, prescribe a dose that's, that's dangerously high or maybe also dangerously low. Um, and yeah, so the, this is uh, an alternative way of actually describing the uh, user and system requirements. And uh, to, to, to recap, the fundamental idea here is to um, make the developers think more like the users because they actually um, should try and imagine in these stories um, how a user would interact with the system. All right. Um, Regarding development, which is a strong focus of extreme programming, we have this concept of pair programming. This means that actually two people sit down on one workstation with one screen and one keyboard, and uh, one person takes the keyboard and writes code, and the other one just discusses with them what they're uh, currently doing. So it's kind of an instant code review approach. Uh, because there's always two people looking over the code and maybe sometimes people uh, swap the keyboard and the other guy is then writing code uh, or handing the keyboard back to the first person and so on. Um, but the fundamental idea is that there's not two people working on two separate computers, but they're to, uh, working on one workstation together. Then we have uh, constant refactoring. I already mentioned this because we also uh, don't want to design uh, too much generalizations up front. We need to keep refactoring the code. Um, and some very fundamental aspects are that we always use descriptive names for every uh, code object. And if uh, code sections grow too long, then we should split them into separate methods and so on. Um, We'll also talk about this in more detail in the lecture about code quality, but these are two examples of how to keep the code uh, readable and, and clean on the fly. Um, another important principle of extreme programming is called collective ownership. Uh, this is also uh, related to pair programming. The idea here is that every developer in the team should be able uh, and should actually try to work on all parts of the system. Um, so that means that nobody has their own uh, sm little small area of expertise where only they know what to actually do. Um, 
this is also sometimes uh, a little uh, snark snarkily called the bus factor. So um, that means if one of the developers is hit by a bus, um, then the project shouldn't come to a halt because then the, the knowledge uh, is basically is lost while that person is in the hospital um, and the project can't continue. So uh, to avoid this, uh, everybody should uh, feel responsible, should feel ownership for all parts of the code um, and should also be able to work on all, all components of the system. This is uh, described by, by the term collective ownership. Um, then there's uh, the idea of test first development. Uh, we should have automated unit tests such uh, like the ones you're also doing in the, um, in the exercises and the tests should actually be written before the code. So this is an important aspect because uh, usually if you write the tests after the code, then again, you start to put in implicit uh, knowledge you have about the code and maybe start missing things. On the other hand, if you write the tests before, then you're uh, basically sure that the tests cover what you actually want to, uh, uh, the functionality you want to have. Um, continuous integration is also an important aspect, which means that whenever one of the tasks derived from the user stories is completed, it should be integrated. Um, and all the rest of the system uh, has to continue passing all tests. So if you integrate a new task and then uh, some other tests start failing, then you should immediately try and fix that before the, the integration can be uh, complete. And uh, one other important aspect of extreme programming is that it suggests to have a sustainable pace of the project. So the developers should not uh, be required to do overtime um, because that always will reduce the long-term performance because then the code becomes sloppy and uh, the quality goes down and that will cause problems in the long run. Of course, this is not something that uh, can entirely be avoided in practice. So sometimes you do have to, to put in overtime to complete something before, before a deadline, but at least ideally, the uh, fundamental idea behind extreme programming says that overtime is always, uh, when people have to do overtime, that's a sign of, of bad planning and bad management for that individual cycle. And uh, it would actually suggest to uh, rather drop features than try to cram it in before the deadline after all. All right. Um, Regarding testing, we have an incremental development cycle, of course. So every two weeks we have a new release. That means we don't have a fixed specification up front, of course. And that in turn means we can't have uh, external test developers, uh, black box testing, as we discussed. Um, and that means the developers themselves have to write the tests. And for this to work properly, they should write the tests before they write the code. I already mentioned this briefly. Um, and when you write the tests before the code, then uh, that means that you have an implicit uh, definition of the interface and also of what the, um, the function, the methods should actually do. So this is kind of the uh, specification and the interface definition without actually having to write a document for that. You do that also in the code, but it only works if you do that before writing the implementation. And another advantage is that this doesn't um, uh, cause tests to lag behind the actual uh, implementation because the tests are always already there once the implementation is finished. And uh, usually, Tests should be derived from the tasks that are uh, derived from the user stories. And the test cases are also something which is uh, where it's a good idea to in actually involve the customer by um, yeah, basically double checking if the test cases actually match real world scenarios well uh, and so on. So this is something where the customer can give feedback and make sure that the um, 
the end re result will actually work with uh, with the environment that uh, that it's going to run in in later. So, how could such a test look like? If we think back to the uh, dose checking uh, scenario, the dose checking task from earlier on, then the input here would be two numbers. One is in milligram and represents one dose of the drug and the other number is the number of doses per day. Maybe you would actually in reality also need an input describing if this is to be taken in the morning or, in the, uh, or for lunch or in the evening. And as tests then you can create different inputs where um, maybe one is where everything is okay and one where uh, the overall dose is, uh, is wrong or when even a single dose is wrong and so on. Um, and the output should of course just be basically a thumbs up or thumbs down whether this dose is uh, acceptable. So that would be one example of how to, to create tests from user stories uh, and from the tasks that are derived from the user stories. Um, of course, extreme programming isn't without uh, little pits, pitfalls. So for example, um, the code coverage might actually be um, not as good as in other uh, test case scenarios um, because the developers might still be inclined to, to skip test cases where they kind of think, well, okay, I'll deal with this in the code anyway. I don't need to test that. And also, if you do constant refactoring then and create new classes, then that might actually cause these new classes to, to be missed in the tests later on. So this is always uh, a bit of a trade-off. And if we do this sort of incremental testing, then the thing we're writing in the first place will be unit tests. And if you think back to the lecture on testing, even if you have full unit test coverage, then um, this will definitely still not catch all classes because we don't have yet integration tests. This is what actually tests the interaction between classes. And these kind of tend to fall down by the wayside if you only write tests for each class first. Um, it's getting difficult to also write the integration tests first, um, but it's still something that shouldn't be neglected because otherwise you often get these, uh, these bugs that result from the interaction between classes and not from the individual class itself. Um, one more thing about pair programming I'd like to mention once again. Uh, this is also actually why we uh, um, suggest to have teams of two people in the exercises um, because every line of code you write is then looked at by two people and you should actually sit down together for the exercises and uh, write the code together because then uh, both of you know about about each part of the code. It's not like one person writes part A and one person writes part B. Um, this is also often how it's done in practice, but uh, if you sit down together on one uh, machine for all parts of the code, then all of you know about each individual part. This is sometimes also called egoless programming. The interesting thing is that there have been studies that, um, <coughs> I'm sorry, the productivity uh, of two people doing pair programming is similar to two people working alone, actually, because you have this continuous di discussion, even if the actual amount of code written is, is uh, maybe not as much as if each person would be writing their code alone, then um, people usually catch it a lot quicker if somebody makes a mistake or uh, starts uh, starts off into a wrong direction with coding and there's also always this implicit knowledge sharing going on so there's always a bit of discussion while you're writing code together and that of course means that um, that uh, the total knowledge of the team is actually higher than if each person would be working in isolation. 
Of course, this is something that it depends a little on, on personality. So sometimes you just have two people that can't really work well together. In that case, pair programming, of course, is more like a liability. But in most cases, it's actually a big advantage to do that, to really sit down together at, on one computer and, and write the code together.